Warm welcome to The Late Show. Today is uh, Wednesday the 24th of June 2020 and in this program today we'll be discussing the Iranian nuclear threat. Now because of the global crisis known as COVID-19, what we've seen over the recent weeks is that it's overshadowed some of the major news stories that are breaking around the world. And one of the biggest news story um, that's occurred in the last week or so is the fact that the, um, the United Nations uh, nuclear watchdog known as the International Atomic Energy Agency um, has released a report in which they're saying that Iran is no longer complying with the Iranian agreement that was signed in 2015. Um, they are accelerating the amount of uranium uh, which is required to actually produce a nuclear weapon. Uh, they are restricting um, IEA, e, sorry, they're instructing the UN uh, Atomic Energy Agency's uh, weapons inspectors to visit some of their nuclear sites. And uh, generally, this is a big threat. And some uh, news articles have also come out in the past week indicate that Iran is very, very close to what is known as a nuclear breakout, meaning that they will acquire nuclear weapons. So we have to ask ourselves, the Iranian regime is the world's most dangerous regime. And ever since it came to power in 1979, it's wanted to establish itself as the main power and the most dominant force in the Middle East and to create what is known as a Shiite crescent dominating across the entire Middle East and to create a land corridor from Tehran all the way to Jerusalem. And at the moment, there was something like 80,000 Iranian troops and militias in Syria. They sponsor Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, which is um, an Islamic terrorist organization, but an army uh, in itself. And uh, now the world needs to wake up to this very, very dangerous threat posed by the Islamic Republic of Iran. So to answer these very, very important questions about how the West should respond, I'm joined tonight by my good friend, Eric Steckelbeck, all the way across the Atlantic in the United States. Warm welcome to the program, Eric. Great to have you on The Late Show. Simon, always great to be with you, my friend. And uh, Eric, can you just give us an update? Because you have so many fans uh, here in the UK. I I'm one of them. Um, explain some of the work that you've been doing regarding the Watchmen and uh, some of your recent um, uh, uh, YouTube uh, programs that you've uploaded. Yes, Simon, thank you so much. Hello to everyone in the UK and beyond. Uh, we are still on TBN. We're on the TBN network uh, every week. And we're also on the Fox Business Network. So we're on globally. It's going really well. And on YouTube, as you mentioned, Simon, it's WatchmanTV.com. We are producing two weekly YouTube newscasts as well. So we're keeping very busy. And even though we have been sheltering in place and we can't travel to Israel, uh, interviews like this and Zoom and all these different tools we have, we're still able to interview people in Israel so still keeping very busy, as you are, Simon, at Revelation TV, and we can't wait to get back on the ground in God's land, Israel. Amen to that. I'm, I'm looking forward to it myself. It was only a year ago that, that we were there with um, Revelation TV's tour of Israel and uh, Jordan. So I'm looking back at the pictures from a year ago and thinking, was that really a year ago? And uh, yeah. how nice it must be to be uh, back in the promised land. But we have to talk about the biggest threat facing the nation of Israel today and also the entire Western world. And that has to be the Islamic uh, Republic of Iran. So uh, according to my notes here, that there was a recent article published on the Gatestone Institute that the Iranian regime since May has increased their total stockpile of low enriched uranium from 1.1 tons to 1.73 tons. And that is eight times more than the regime is allowed under the Iranian uh, nuclear deal. Um, what do you make of the news reports coming out that uh, the, the UN's uh, international, sorry, the UN's um, energy, uh, nuclear energy watchman, known yeah. as uh, the United, uh, sorry, as the, uh, for, uh, for, I forget, it's the IAEA, um, have actually yeah. then criticised the Iranian regime, saying it's failing to meet up to its standards, it's stopping weapons inspectors, and they're increasing the enrichment of uranium that's needed to create a nuclear bomb. Yes, yeah, Simon, I would say, first of all, uh, what took you so long? About time that the IAEA, it is a tongue twister, by the way, <laughs> trying to say that. 
<laughs> I've had the same problem. It, it's, IA... it's, late, it's late here as well, Eric, so I'm not my best at uh, this, this time of night, so you have to forgive me a little bit. It's, it's about five o'clock in the afternoon where you are. I know, I know. Hey, about time, IAEA, about time, international community, about time, UN, that you've actually been forceful and called the Iranian regime out on its illicit nuclear activity. Simon, you cited some of the key statistics that they are enriching uranium at an unacceptable rate, number one. And number two, another key point, the IAEA report said that the Iranians refused to allow inspectors, international inspectors, to investigate two of their nuclear sites. Now, what is Iran trying to hide? It begs the question, why will they not allow international inspectors to take a look at these two nuclear sites? Clearly, Simon, Iran is not keeping to the spirit, to the letter of the law of that 2015 nuclear deal, a disastrous nuclear deal on every level. I'm here in the United States. Thank God that we have pulled out of the Iran deal. But unfortunately, Europe uh, seems to be determined to try to make this deal work. Russia and China, obviously, are cheering for it. And the UN would like to have it as well. But Iran doesn't want to play ball. Iran is nodding and saying, oh, yes, we will follow all the regulations. But behind the scenes, they're doing exactly the opposite. And the real concern here, Simon, is that if Iran decides, you know what, we are going for it. We are going to enrich all the uranium we need to actually develop a nuclear bomb. Uh, there are beliefs, uh, many nuclear analysts, there is the belief that Iran could have the bomb, if it chooses to do so, could have the bomb within months. That's a dangerous situation, not only for the immediate region, the Saudis, Israel, of course, but for the entire world, the Western world, the United States, uh, it would spark a nuclear arms race in the world's most chaotic region, the Middle East. Absolutely. Uh, and Eric, the situation is, is very different um, to what we faced in uh, 2003 before the uh, American, uh, British and Allied forces went in to remove Saddam Hussein um, from, um, well, remove him as uh, president of Iraq and, and bring about a regime change. Um, on the, uh, that was on the pretext that he had weapons of mass destruction. Now, there was question marks whether uh, whether Saddam Hussein actually had those weapons of mass destruction, but in the case with Iran, this is the in, this is the UN's own nuclear watchdog actually calling out the Iranian regime for not complying with the Iran agreement, um, not allowing them to send in um, nuclear uh, scientists to actually inspect their nuclear sites. And this is coming from the UN. This is not coming from President Trump. This is not coming from the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. How serious? Seriously, should the world take this, knowing that this is coming from um, the UN's own nuclear watchdog? Absolutely. Very serious, Simon. If even the UN, which has been very soft on Iran, the Iranian regime, to say the least, over the years, if even the UN is starting to get fed up, you know we have a serious problem. Simon, picture the scenario. A nuclear-armed Iran with that apocalyptic expansionist ideology, not only would a nuclear bomb provide Iran with a nuclear umbrella, but it would also provide nuclear cover and a nuclear umbrella for Iran's proxies. I'm talking about Hezbollah, Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, these various Shia militias in Iraq. The next time, God forbid, Hezbollah would rain down rockets on Israel or Hamas would rain down rockets on Israel and Israel was prepared to respond in an appropriate and forceful way to defend its citizens, a nuclear-armed Iran might say, don't you dare. Don't even think about it. If you, if you, whoa, we just had a light fall here. I apologize. Technical difficulty of my own. If you dare uh, strike against Hezbollah or Hamas, a nuclear-armed Iran, Iran could say, then we will retaliate in a way that you may not be able to predict Israel. It would, in the very least, give Israel pause before retaliating against the likes of Hezbollah and Hamas if the Iranian master of these two terror organizations was nuclear-armed. Absolutely. So let's have a look at this uh, recent uh, news item that says that Iran is in violation of the Iranian nuclear deal. Did you go save it? 
very few words in the beginning after which you'll be happy to take your questions. They might reduce cooperation with the IAEA at the declared site. We have two jobs. Uh, there are areas where our cooperation is ongoing uh, and there is this issue where quite clearly we are in disagreement. For a couple of years and you've been validating this information, we know that in... Think what we, had, we are seeking is a, a dialogue uh, with uh, Iran to ascertain uh, whether um, these, uh, the activities that we believe took place in these places and the nuclear material uh, exists, is there or not, and should be put uh, under safeguards or, or not. So in this case, it is obviously uh, quite uh, relevant, non-proliferation-wise. It's, it's been a very vigorous debate historically in yeah. the agency. Uh, the places are, are relevant because there is information on, on, on the three of them um, having um, um, been uh, places where nuclear activity and the presence of nuclear material uh, is, is, uh, is very possible. Uh, so uh, the, the places are well known to, to us and, and, and to them. Um, here we, we do have a process uh, of, of engagement uh, with, with Iran and we do have a disagreement, which is clear on this particular request for access. But we do also have, and this is well known, there are lots of uh, other verification activities ongoing uh, in the country. So I think one has to establish the facts uh, clearly no, in order not, not to rush into, in, into uh, other um, speculations. Thank you very much. Have a nice afternoon. And just a reminder that we are live, we are interactive, uh, and my question for you tonight is a very important one. Um, as Iran reaches nuclear breakout, how should the international community respond to the fact that Iran could very soon have a nuclear bomb? Um, Eric, um, can you give us a little bit of a backdrop? I, I, I'm just going to ask, just got some notes here. Uh, can you give us a brief account of how we ended up here as the Iranian nuclear deal and uh, uh, known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, agreed by Iran and the five permanent members of the UN Security Council? That's the United States, uh, UK, France, Russia, China, and plus the EU that was signed in 2015, believing that this would actually stop Iran's nuclear ambitions. Yeah, Simon, you know, this Iran nuclear crisis really stretches further back to the 1990s. There were concerns about Iran developing nuclear weapons, but it really went into overdrive in 2015, obviously, with this Iran nuclear deal. If you think back, Simon, to 2012, 2013, there were a lot of rumblings that Israel was going to strike Iran's nuclear facilities. Obviously, the U.S. administration at the time, the Obama administration, was trying to hold Israel back from doing that. And we ended up with this situation in 2015 where world powers, which you just named, came together and agreed to this deal with the Iranian regime. From an American perspective, and I believe from a, a British perspective, a French perspective, a European Western perspective, it was a disaster, Simon, on every level. Uh, it gave Iran the capability after 10 years to basically break out. Hey, it's already been five years. Does anyone watching feel comfortable with the prospect of a nuclear-armed genocidal regime within the next five years? That's what this deal grants. Also, Simon, and this is a key point that I think is overlooked, the Iran nuclear deal signed in July 2015 does not address Iran's ballistic missile program. Iran has the largest ballistic missile program in the entire Middle East. Missiles that can reach Saudi Arabia, Israel, even parts of Europe. And guess what? The Iranian regime is also working on intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs that could reach where I'm sitting right now, the United States. And that makes sense because Iran refers to the United States as the great Satan. So, they are building ICBMs as well, and you only build those weapons, Simon, for one reason and one reason only, to mount them with a nuclear warhead. Yet none of these missile programs 
are even mentioned in that Iran nuclear deal. Basically, it's a, a handover to Iran of billions of dollars in sanctions relief. And Simon, guess what? The billions of dollars that Iran has added, the Iranian regime has added since 2015 as a result of this deeply flawed deal, those dollars haven't gone to feed the Iranian people. They haven't gone to build schools and playgrounds in Tehran. They have gone into the pockets of Hamas and Hezbollah to destroy schools and playgrounds in Israel. That is the bitter truth of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I mean, I mean, considering when this uh, the Iranian nuclear agreement was signed in 2015, everyone thought that this was uh, a chance of uh, peace and this would solve one of the biggest foreign policy challenges um, in the 21st century. Uh, and yet, the Obama administration, as you said, completely overlooked um, Iran's uh, ballistic missile program. They also then refused um, to open up their military sites. So Iran is quite capable of actually building um, the atomic bomb, actually one of their military sites. And, and so they, as part of that agreement, would not even be looked on uh, by the UN um, weapons inspectors. So. Why did the administration enter into this agreement, knowing that it would only be 10 years, um, uh, 10 years or five years before the regime would actually have nuclear weapons, and in return hand the Iranians billions in, in, in sanctions relief, which actually saved the regime because it was on the verge of economic collapse? Simon, I think there's two key things here from an American perspective and trying to get into the heads of the Obama administration. Number one, that administration fundamentally misunderstood the Middle East and how it works. The Iranian regime in particular operates according to an ideology. It is an apocalyptic, radical, genocidal ideology. What the Ayatollahs say when they say death to Israel, death to America, they call Israel the little Satan, America the great Satan. They truly mean it. It's not just bluster for domestic consumption. They truly mean what they say. Simon, think about it. If the 20th century, the century of Hitler, Stalin, and Mao taught us anything, it's that when evil men tell you they want to kill you, you should listen, and you should take them very seriously. The Iranian regime for over 40 years now has been telling us exactly that. Yet the Obama administration apparently did not take them seriously. Many in Europe still do not take them seriously. So we had a situation where... It was clearly appeasement. Hey, if we give them money, they'll be nice and they will leave us alone. It did exactly the opposite. Iran got the money, billions. It's basically blackmail, Simon. They got the money and they, it emboldened them. It's when, when you give a bully more, they want, they're want they not satisfied. They're going to try and take even more. That's exactly what Iran did. And we saw them expand their tentacles into Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, these are basically Iranian satellites right now. The nuclear deal only emboldened them to take even greater action. The mullahs in Tehran said, hey, the West is basically giving us billions of dollars and not requiring anything from us. We can do whatever we want. And that's exactly what they did until the new U.S. administration uh, came to power. So very key point here is the fundamental, mis if you could say misunderstanding, I guess if that's a word, of the Iranian regime's ideology. And also the Obama administration, the second reason, Simon, real quick, from the beginning of his administration in 2008, he sought to level the playing field in his, in his mind and not favor Israel, which is a huge mistake because Israel is the one shining beacon of freedom and Absolutely. democracy in a tyrannical region. Well, I got a, a message in. This one says, uh, what happened to the program, um, so-called the West Bank? Keep up the good work. And that's from R and M on the Isle of Wight. Uh, that was last week. So you can watch it on Catch Up or um, if you want to see the debate that we discussed about Israel extending uh, their Israeli sovereignty to the Jewish communities in the biblical heartland of Israel, known as Judea and Samaria. Um, let's go and, and look at this excellent um, news item now. This is produced by the Israeli Foreign Ministry, um, warning uh, and showing us the process of how a nuclear bomb is actually built and why the West should be so concerned that Iran is very close to nuclear breakout.
enriching uranium, the Iranian nuclear deal, centrifuges. We are constantly bombarded with endless information about Iran and its race to a nuclear bomb. But for most of us, these terms are complicated. So let's make it simple. Uranium is the chemical element used for nuclear weapons. In order to build a uranium-based nuclear bomb, you first need to amass hundreds of kilograms of uranium. You then need to enrich the uranium to a level above 90% purity using equipment called centrifuges. The enriched uranium used to create the core of the nuclear bomb is then attached to a detonating device. Now let's make it even more simple. The nuclear deal is supposed to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons capabilities. But in reality, in the last months, Iran has violated this agreement again and again and again. How? Well, first, the nuclear deal restricts the amount of uranium Iran is allowed to accumulate to 300 kilograms. Today, Iran has more than 500 kilograms of uranium. Second, Iran began enriching the uranium to levels higher than the 3.67% permitted by the agreement. Third, Iran is now feeding the uranium into centrifuges at an underground military bunker built specifically for creating nuclear weapons. Fourth, Iran is resuming nuclear research and development, bringing it closer than ever to nuclear capability. These are all violations of Iran's commitment under the nuclear deal. In November, Iran also canceled the accreditation of an IAEA inspector and prevented the organization from accessing the Natanz nuclear site. So, if you weren't convinced before, it is now clearer than ever that Iran is brazenly violating its commitments under the JCPOA. Iran is lying to the international community. And the most dangerous part of all of this is that Iran is moving faster than ever towards nuclear capability. A nuclear Iran would endanger not only Israel, but countries over 2,000 kilometers away in Africa, Asia, and Europe. The international community must act now. So we are live, we are interactive tonight, so very much I love uh, your views and opinions as the Iranian regime is close to a nuclear breakout and how should the international community respond. Um, I have to, uh, Eric, I have some very technical questions and this is from the uh, Gatestone Institute. Um, uh, this says, as of May uh, the 20th, 2020, uh, the Iranian regime has increased its total stockpile of low enriched uranium uh, from 1,020.9 kilograms, that's 1.1 tonnes, to 1,571.6 kilograms, that is 1.73 tonnes. This is, that is approximately eight times more than what the regime was allowed to maintain under the JCPOA uh, Iranian nuclear deal. And according to the terms of the JCPOA, uh, Iran has been permitted to keep a stockpile of around 447 pounds and enrich uranium up to 3.67%. Iran is now enriching um, uranium up to the purity of 4.5% and possesses far more heavy water than permitted under the nuclear agreement. Uh, and now the regime has enriched enough uranium to create a nuclear bomb. Um, how disturbing is this news? And, and how should the um, international community respond to this devastating news that Iran is very close to developing nuclear weapons? Uh, first of all, the Gatestone Institute, uh, who asked that question, do great work. And they are right on point with what they're saying. I, I wasn't a math major, but it's pretty easy to follow those numbers eight times more than the, the permitted agreed upon amount of enriched uranium, the amount that was agreed upon in that 2015 Iran nuclear deal. How should the international community respond? I believe the international community should isolate this regime. I think the United States right now is taking the right approach, strong sanctions against the regime. The problem is not the Iranian people. The problem is this tyrannical regime that is oppressing the Iranian people. So sanction the regime. The United States uh, designated the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, the real power brokers in the regime, kind of the Iranian version of the Nazi SS. They answered directly to the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei. The United States designated the IRGC as a terrorist organization, great move, pulled out the Iran deal, and really turned up the heat 
with sanctions on the Iranian regime. And it's interesting, some are going wobbly now, Simon. Some in the West are saying, including in the U.S., are saying, hey, uh, Trump administration, ease up on those sanctions against Iran because Iran is really struggling right now as a result of COVID-19. I think that's a bad idea. I think we keep the heat on the Iranian regime, no daylight there, keep the sanctions on, pressure this regime back until its back is against the wall. Gradually, it's moving in that direction. My prediction, unfortunately, is that the regime will likely lash out rather than try to come to some kind of agreement uh, with the West. So the West and the international community need to have, you know, spines made of steel here, Simon, and need to be prepared to stand their ground in the face of Iranian bullying, deceit, and aggression. But, uh, Eric, are we seeing that the West is kind of being very weak? I mean, we know that uh, President Trump has uh, taken a very tough stand on the Iranian regime and is actually having a very, very big impact in the region. But, you know, if we turn our attention to Britain, we turn our attention um, to the European Union and on uh, this European continent, we're seeing nothing but appeasement by, by Europe at a time when we, the world is focused on dealing with the COVID-19 global pandemic. Pandemic. Do you think this is a smokescreen for the real danger that the world um, is in great danger because of the Iranian regime being very, very close to a nuclear breakout? And that would completely change the whole dynamics of the Middle East and actually put Europe's own security under threat of Iranian ballistic missiles? Yes, Simon, I think you hit the nail on the head, as they say. Uh, the European approach to the Iranian nuclear menace has been for me distressing to see there's been a philosophy of appeasement i think that was uh, symbolized by the 2015 iranian nuclear deal which again didn't require anything from the regime but the deal asked everything of the west including billions of dollars in sanctions relief wrong approach across the board it makes you wonder if people are really students of history did we follow the 1930s when the Nazi regime was growing in power, threatening its neighbors, threatening genocide against the Jewish people? It happened once. Do we learn from history or are we doomed to repeat those same mistakes? I believe in the approach of the West to the Iranian nuclear menace, which is growing by the day, and not only the nuclear menace, Simon. Think of the power Iran wields throughout the region. Uh, in Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, and Iraq, who proxies the Houthis in Yemen, Shia militias in Iraq and Syria, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas in Gaza. This is a powerful regime, which also has a very strong external terror operation and network beyond the Middle East. I'm talking even right here in the Western Hemisphere and, yes, Europe. The response from much of the West has not been forceful and resolute. It's been more, hey, here's some money. Now, please just be nice and leave us alone, and we will trust you to change your behavior. It's not going to work. And Iran knows it, and they're feeling very good about themselves. They're building a dangerous alliance, by the way, with Turkey and Russia. We, we have Vladimir Putin, President Erdogan of Turkey, and President Rouhani of Iran meeting pretty frequently now in their various capitals. That is a dangerous alliance, Simon, and the West better wake up. Yes, a global pandemic, obviously a very serious crisis going on right now with the coronavirus. But let's not also take our eyes off the Iran ball, as they say, because this thing could flare up in the Middle East, God forbid, at any moment as Iran and who in particular, Simon, Hezbollah, continue their aggression, not only against Israel, but against Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states and beyond. Uh, just got uh, a very good uh, email come through, and this is from Jill, who writes, Hi, guys. Uh, thank you for the program. Very enlightening indeed. This is very disturbing. As a wife of a nuclear test veteran who sat under three H-bombs and two A-bombs, I think President Trump 
is taking the right action. As usual, our government here are too wishy-washy. Uh, that's a brilliant email, so thank you for that one. Um, Jill, Eric, I have to ask you, um, in terms of where would we be um, without Israel's uh, security forces? Where would we be without Israeli intelligence? Um, even at a time when Israel was warning of the dangers that the Iranian regime um, uh, that presented not only to Israel but also to the Middle East and it was only uh, a decade ago uh, or so that we had um, the former Iranian president Ahmadinejad almost call for the destruction of Israel on a daily basis and now we see that Israel carried out a very daring raid back in um, 2018 in which they recovered tons of archived material on Iran's nuclear sites and Iran's nuclear development uh, from a warehouse just outside of Tehran. How much do we have to, Israel to thank for the knowledge that we have in terms of where Iran is in terms of being able to uh, have nuclear breakout? Simon, the West owes a profound debt of gratitude to Israel, not only the Israel Defense Forces, the IDF, but to Israeli intelligence. As you mentioned, Simon, that incredible haul, that covert operation in Iran, acquiring these top secret documents that showed really the scope of Iran's illegal nuclear weapons program. Also, in essence, Israel is the first line of defense for the West, if you think about it, Simon, because this tiny nation is literally in the middle of the belly of the beast, the Middle East, standing in the gap. The barbarians are not, not just at the gates, they are inside the gates. Israel is all that's holding back the wolves of jihad, whether it's the Iranian regime, Hezbollah, ISIS, Al-Qaeda. Israel is all that separates those barbaric forces from coming right here to our backyard in the West. So Israel is fighting the good fight in terms of the IDF, in terms of Israeli intelligence. Israeli intelligence, Simon, has broken up hundreds, if not thousands, of terror plots against the UK, against America, against the West, Europe in general, since 9-11 alone. Israel is an invaluable ally in a region of the world where we need it most. The one nation we can truly rely on through thick and thin, through various administrations in Israel, is the state of Israel in the Middle East. The, the connection and the alliance goes so much deeper. Not only do we share common enemies, as you and I are discussing, Simon, but Israel and the West share common values. You could Absolutely. say that Western civilization was born on Mount Sinai when Moses received the Ten Commandments from God Almighty. And I've got uh, an email from Les who writes, uh, Israel cannot and uh, must not allow Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Uh, no matter what other nations think about it, it is not something that should even be up for discussion. So that's a, a very good email. Um, and Eric, how do you think that Israel will respond to the news that, um, that Iran is close to a nuclear breakout because for the last decade or so we, we've heard constant news reports about how um, the Israelis could carry out airstrikes on Iran's nuclear facilities and now they have a very supportive president in President Trump. Um, do you think that we could see that uh, Trump could give Israel the green light or do you think the Americans might take military action to prevent Iran from developing the world's most deadliest weapon? I think both of those scenarios are possible, Simon. I have to say, both the Trump administration and Prime Minister Netanyahu have made it very clear they will not accept a nuclear-armed Iran under any circumstances. It is an existential threat for both Israel and the United States, not to mention the UK. So I don't think President Trump or the current Israeli administration would accept a nuclear Iran. I think if Israel didn't take action, I think it would be very likely that the United States would take action if there was actionable intelligence that, yes, Iran was on the verge of breaking out and acquiring a nuclear weapon. It is a red line that Israel has drawn. No way will we allow Iran. Uh, remember, a regime, Simon, that literally every day, it seems, threatens the annihilation, the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people. No nation in its right mind would allow that, would allow a sworn enemy. And remember, Iran has declared war, at least verbally, 
on Israel. It wasn't the other way around. Iran, since this regime came to power in 1979, has viciously attacked Israel, not only in rhetoric, but through proxy, through Hezbollah, through Hamas. Iran has terror proxies perched on every corner of the Jewish state. Israel is just doing what it has to do to defend itself and to defend its citizenry. So a big part of that, a big part of that self-defense is never permitting the Iranian regime, a regime that, again, means what it says when it talks about wiping Israel off the map. Israel can never allow, allow Iran the capability, the weapons, to accomplish that goal. And neither can the United States, by the way, because Iran has talked about a world without America in some of their speeches and their rhetoric, some of the Iranian leaders, I should say. So non-starter for the U.S. and Israel. I don't think the Trump administration would allow it. Uh, I can't speak for a future U.S. administration, though. And But I think any Israeli government uh, would not uh, see fit to accept a nuclear Iran, no matter who is in power. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, especially, has been very clear he's not having it. How important is it that when we discuss the, this very important topic, which I believe is the greatest foreign policy challenge of the Western world today, um, setting aside the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic, um, how should the West respond to the Iranian nuclear threat? And what I mean by that is that um, what is the ideology that drives this Iranian regime? What is their end, what is their end goal? What is their ultimate objective? Um, because we know that they want to create what is known as a Shiite crescent, dominate uh, the entire Middle East and have a kind of Persian empire again that spans right across the Middle East. They want to destroy Israel. They said they want to liberate um, Jerusalem, but they've also made the fact that they want to destroy the Western world. So what is the ideology that is really the driving force behind this Iranian regime that is wanting them to have nuclear weapons? Simon, I think you just laid it out perfectly. Uh, they want to revive the ancient Persian Empire, which saw ancient Persia, which is modern-day Iran. Read it in your Bible. They controlled most of the known world about 25, 2,600 years ago, including even into Europe, all of the Middle East, North Africa, into Europe, even into India, Iran wants to revive that empire, but this time that empire would have a radical Islamic ideology that, as you said, sought to destroy Israel. That's a, that's, that's a must. That is required for their ideology. They must destroy Israel. That is the creed they live by, expand the empire, and Ayatollah Khomeini, the original supreme leader of Iran, the godfather of this revolution, back in 1979, Simon, he made very clear, this is a global revolution. He never intended for the Iranian revolution to be confined only with, within Iran's borders. The goal and the intention for the Iranian regime has always been to take this revolution global. That is ultimately what they want starting with the Middle East and their immediate neighbors, which we see right now, they're having great success doing it, and extending beyond that even, yes, uh, into the West. And another strain that is very important in this regime, Simon, not to get too in the weeds, when I talk about this being an apocalyptic regime, this is a very key point, because Iran's leaders truly believe they can usher in the return of the Islamic Messiah. They call him the Mahdi or the 12th Imam. I know it sounds a little crazy, but bear with me. They believe if a, that their Messiah will return during a time of great global unrest and war and conflict, and that Messiah will lead the armies of Islam led by Iran to victory. I know it sounds crazy, but they truly believe this. This is the ideology that drives them, and they are shaping policy around this apocalyptic ideology. Look, they want to lead the Islamic world. They've talked about this often, and that's what they're trying to do. And they see Saudi Arabia right across the Persian Gulf, Simon, the home to Mecca and Medina, the two holiest sites in Islam. Iran sees that, and I, I can tell you, they their eyes light up when they see that. They have very sinister intentions, not only for Israel, uh, but for their neighbors. Um, Eric, that might be the president. You might want to take it. Um, it might be. I apologize. It's not my phone. It's my laptop.
Uh, no, no worries. Um, Eric, uh, I think an important question I have to ask really is, is how does this fit into kind of Bible prophecy? Because we know that we yeah. see that Israel as a nation has been redeemed over the last uh, 72 years. Uh, it's a nation uh, that was born in one single day in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. We are seeing the emergence of ancient um, biblical empires, uh, for example, Iraq, and, uh, which, is, which was um, Babylon. We see the emergence of, of the revival of the, uh, the old ancient Persian empire as well. So what role do you think Iran plays in the end time biblical scenario? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Simon, we've been talking, this is, it's heavy subject matter. Absolutely, of course. Is, it's serious stuff we're talking about, you know, but the book of Amos says, God says through the prophet Amos, my people perish for lack of knowledge. I think everyone watching would rather know than not know what this evil regime is up to, because what happens in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. And if the body of Christ is not educated, if spirit-filled believers are not educated about this and shining light, then no one else is going to do it. I believe, Simon, we have a biblical mandate to be salt and light and to spread the truth for such a time as this. Now, where does Iran fall uh, in the prophetic scenario? I look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39, Simon. You and I have discussed this many times. The Bible talks about in Ezekiel 38 and 39, the war of Gog and Magog. I encourage everyone to check it out, go to your Bible and take a look. And many believe that the nations described descri describe in this Gog and Magog invasion. It's a last days invasion. It says this is going to happen in the latter days, an invasion of Israel. And it seems to name Russia, Turkey, and it mentions Persia specifically. Again, modern-day Iran was ancient Persia. Mentions other nations, uh, sur nations surrounding Israel. And it mentions these nations coming against Israel in the latter days. Key point there. And the good news, we're talking about encouragement here. These nations fall. They are destroyed on the mountains of Israel by God himself. God will intervene in the affairs of man like he hasn't in 2,000 years during this Gog and Magog invasion, he will destroy the enemies of Israel. They will fall on the mountains of Israel. This invasion isn't going to go very far, but sadly, Persia is one of the nations named in that Gog and Magog invasion force, and it doesn't end very well for them on the mountains of Israel in the latter days. And we talk about Russia, Turkey, and Iran being part of this invasion coalition, Simon. We mentioned earlier, right? Russia, Turkey, and Iran right now have a blossoming alliance, and right now, all of them are at the doorstep of Israel in Syria. Uh, Iran, Turkey, and Russia all have a presence in Syria at Israel's northern doorstep, right across from the mountains of Israel. Very interesting. We live in Bible times. Absolutely, which uh, which is exciting, but also uh, very dangerous as well, as, as we know that uh, the Lord is very close to uh, to His return. So we could be the the final generation that sees the Book of Revelation unfold. Um, Eric, I have to ask you, which is also very significant as well, that Iran is spiritually one of the most darkest nations across the world, and certainly being controlled by that uh, spirit of um, spirit of Persia, of ancient Persia, that prevented um, the uh, arch. Is it arch um, angel Gabriel from actually visiting um, Daniel um, sure. to give the vision from God? Now, we know in Iran, despite the horrendous oppression against its people, its horrendous uh, human rights abuses, we see that the underground church in Iran is growing in incredible numbers and that Iranian believers in Jesus Christ are so keen to spread the gospel that many of them have fled the regime, have gone back to Iran to share the gospel. Um, do you think we could actually see um, an incredible revival take place uh, in Iran, despite the fact that Iran is such a totalitarian regime. Simon, I am so glad that you asked me this. And hey, everyone watching, you want encouragement? Get ready. Here is some encouragement for you. The Iranian church 
is the fastest growing church in the world. In the world. And here's the interesting thing about it, Simon. It's all underground. Uh, It's an underground movement. It reminds you of the early church in Israel 2,000 years ago. It's a largely underground movement. Many women are involved in the leadership. It's a young movement uh, with many young Iranians. Remember, 70% of the Iranian population is under the age of 30. And the church, uh, the body of Christ, the gospel, is spreading inside Iran. Isn't that exciting? Not only that, the Iranian regime knows this. They're threatened by it, and they are cracking down severely on the believers. So I hope everyone watching, number one, can pray that the church just continues to grow by leaps and bounds exceedingly abundantly above all that we can hope and imagine, the church in Iran. And number two, pray for the persecuted believers in Iran. Here in the West, at least for now, we can worship freely. They don't have that luxury in Iran right now. Again, it's it's largely underground, this movement, but... I truly believe that we are seeing a revival in Iran. And Simon, if one day that Iranian regime was not around, it would really be interesting to see how the gospel was received inside Iran. I talked to many Iranians who have lived under this regime for the past 41 years, which is is supposedly a religious, they would say, uh, regime. And these young Iranian people say, if this is religion, if this is God, I don't want any part of this. And sadly, many of them are becoming atheists, non-believers, because they've seen the behavior of these mullahs and ayatollahs in Iran who are supposedly acting in the name of God, being brutal and spreading terror and oppressing their people. So what we need is for the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to continue to penetrate Iran, to penetrate the hearts of these young Iranian people who are so jaded and turned off by what they've seen. There is another way. His name is Yeshua, Jesus. And the Iranian people more and more are hearing it, and it's exciting. Amen. And also I want to bring in, I know we've had a discussion last year on this, uh, and um, we're good friends of uh, Bill uh, Koenig, who was on the program uh, last week. And this is an issue to do with Genesis um, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Meaning that there is no other nation on this planet that is cursing Israel and the Jewish people as much as the Iranian regime. And what we've seen in recent years is they've had uh, judgment on biblical scales. Firstly, earthquakes. They've had um, they've had bird flu. They've had floodings. Um, they've had a horrendous experience of dealing with COVID-19. And now because of the sanctions placed uh, on the regime by President Trump, um, their economy is as bad as it was prior to the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Um, They are running out of money in um, Syria to actually fund their war in supporting uh, Bashar al-Assad. Hezbollah are also complaining now that they're going to have to tighten their belts because there's a lack of money coming into this terror organization. And, And however much the world wants to hate President Trump, He's actually making the world and the Middle East a safer place. And the regime is really on the verge of collapse. So if President Trump wins a second term, surely we'll see the end uh, of this regime because it can't continue to curse uh, the nation of Israel and get away with it. Yeah, no nation, Simon, will exist for very long if it curses Israel and the Jewish people. Genesis 12, 3, where God tells Abraham, I will bless those who bless Israel and the Jewish people, and I will curse those who curse Israel and the Jewish people. It is powerful, and it is real. Simon, God meant what he said. Let's look first at the curses. Hey, where are the Philistines today? Where is Pharaoh? Where is Haman, prime minister of the mighty Persian Empire, the Greeks, the Romans, the Assyrians, the Nazis, the Tsars? Where are they? All of them cursed Israel and the Jewish people, and all of them are now in the ash heap of history. But who survives, Simon, against all odds, not only survives, but thrives today? Israel. It's improbable. The existence of Israel proves the existence of God, because many things prove the existence of God, of course, but that is one. The fact that Israel is still alive, that it was reborn after 2,000 years of exile, 
and genocide and pogroms and persecution. Simon, who ever heard of such a thing for a nation to return 2,000 years later to revive the ancient Hebrew language and to continue to grow and thrive and be a light unto the nations and bless the world, even as its neighbors continue to try to annihilate it? Only God. Only God could be behind such a miraculous nation and the miraculous turn of events. So uh, the shelf life is not very long for regimes that curse Israel and the Jewish people. And when it comes to blessings, I'm in the United States. Arguably, the United States is probably the most prosperous nation and most powerful nation in many ways in the history of the world. I don't think it's a coincidence because the United States was founded by godly men, number one. But number two, the U.S. has blessed Israel. By and large, the United States has been a loyal friend and ally of Israel. And the day we take, uh, the, the day we cease, God forbid, uh, being a friend of Israel is the day that our blessings end. And that would be tragic, not only for the United States, but also for the free world. Eric, I have to ask you a very important uh, question now, um, as we uh, close, uh, come to a close of this program. And that is, as believers, what is our role um, in terms of these end times, knowing that we're seeing the fulfillment of biblical prophecy unfold before our very eyes in the Middle East? As, and as supporters of Israel, how do we stand with Israel and how do we... Um, uh, be watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem and warn the world about the danger of the Iranian nuclear threat and uh, how this poses a, a direct threat not only to the Middle East, not only to Israel, but also Europe and potentially the United States. Yeah, I think we have a biblical mandate to do this, Simon. Again, if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it. I think, number one, we need to be a light in the growing darkness that we see, not only in Iran, but really around the world. Believers, followers of Jesus, we have to live blamelessly, uh, in my view, Simon. We, we're all sinners. We're all going to fall. We're all going to mess up. Thankfully, we have the gift of grace provided by Jesus. But Amen. we have to walk the walk. We can't just talk the talk and say, hey, I'm a Christian. No, you have to also walk the walk. And... and the Bible talks about being blameless in the sight of God. In front of your fellow man, especially those who are not believers, let's show them the love and the light of Christ. And let's uphold. Hey, we have a heavy mantle as believers, and to whom much is given, much is required. So as believers, we need to be leaders, not only in words, but in deeds and by our actions. Again, walk the walk. Show the light of Jesus as much as we can. I think that's key. Part of that is doing what we are doing right now, Simon, for a large audience here on Revelation TV, sounding the alarm and being watchmen on the wall, but just at your family level, in your home, your friends, your neighbors, your family members, your coworkers, you can be that light. You may have non-believing coworkers, family members. I do, and I'm sure Simon has some, hey, you can be the one that God has positioned in their lives Amen. to be a light and to share the gospel, to have that profound impact on them. So we can do that, number one, on a personal level. But number two, we have so many tools to also share these warnings, share the truth about Israel, share the warnings about Iran. We have social media, which many times, unfortunately, is used for bad. We can use it for good, Instagram, Facebook, to spread the truth. So there's many ways we can do it. We can join like-minded organizations, support Revelation TV, watch the Watchmen show, and get the word out. Absolutely. For Zion's sake. Eric, Eric sadly we've come to the end of the program now, but thank you so much for joining me from uh, Washington, D.C., and thank you for your excellent contribution and, and continue to be the watchman to warn America about the dangers posed by the Islamic Republic of Iran and the need to stand with Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you, Simon. God bless everyone. God I will bless. see you again soon. Stay safe. Thank you. And I just want to thank you for watching uh, tonight's program as we've discussed how the Iranian regime is very close to a nuclear breakout, meaning that if Iran has nuclear weapons, they can continue their support for international terrorism around the world, and they pose the biggest danger 
to the free world. So therefore, it's important that we make a stand, that we pray and intercede on behalf of Israel and pray that the international community acts before it's too late. So I want to thank you for watching The Late Show.